Hi! Welcome to Marks in 15 Minutes. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about conflict theory, which is uh, Karl Marx's um, came up with this theory. We discussed that a little bit before. <clears throat> it's a macro theory. And by macro, we're interested here, just like we are in functionalism, with the whole social system, the large system of society. Um, first, some definitions. Um, Marx saw two social classes, basically, for, in, for introductory purposes. He saw two. The proletariat, which is basically someone who has nothing to sell but their labor. Someone who has to work for someone else. And the bourgeois are the capitalist, the owners of the means of production. So during industrialization, when Marx was uh, writing during the Industrial Revolution, the people who owned the factories were the capitalists, or the bourgeois. Okay, so his conceptualization of society is a lot different from um, uh, Durkheim's. It's different from functionalism. Instead of seeing everything as interrelated like a spider web, um, Marx saw societies as a pyramid. If you picture a pyramid, the bottom layer of the pyramid he calls the base. And by that he means this is the basis on which the whole rest of society is built. Without this, everything falls apart. He said the institution of economy is at the base. Without the economy, you wouldn't have anything else. The economy was a way to distribute, uh, the other institutions are a way to distribute the surplus or the rewards created by the economy. And so the base is the economy. Now for Marx, that also meant mode of production. Um, and that's how you make your living. So in his time, it was an industrial mode of production. Uh, they, the economy was based on factories and factory work. Uh, now we have a post-industrial economy. Okay, so we've got the base. The next one that rests on top of the base, just like these sticky notes, is the structure. And the structure for Marx is all of the other institutions, except those that he pulls out as special in, for the base, like the economy's in the base, and religion is in the superstructure, which we'll talk about in a minute. So because of the economy, because you get other institutions, like work, the way that work is organized, schooling to certify you for a place in the economy. He says the economy drives the society. You wouldn't have, without an economy, you wouldn't have these other complex institutions. And on top of that, so structure and conflict theory refers to institutions. And on top of that, it's a really bad pyramid, <laughs> um, is the superstructure. So the top of the pyramid is the superstructure. So he sees society as a pyramid. Each layer rests on the other and wouldn't exist without the one beneath it. Superstructure are institution, any, any kind of ideology that serves to explain away inequality, making it seem normal and natural. That can include the institution of religion, that can include uh, what we call, sometimes in sociology we call it civic religion, uh, sort of the idea of the American dream, that everyone can get it when all the evidence points to, no, factually, that's just not so. It's kind of like winning a lottery. You know, if you've got the right circumstances, um, the right background, some luck, you know, it can happen. But for most of us, the reality is, is that our, our social class determines our chances. Okay, so superstructure is, can be the institution of religion. It can be the institution of politics. If you have a political explanation for why inequality is okay, then that's also part of the 
superstructure. So with any ideas, any ideology that explains, to, that says to people, yes, we have a lot of inequality, and that's okay. That's okay because God said so. You know, that's okay because um, my political values say that if, that if you were a hard worker, you would be a millionaire. Uh, these kinds of things are ideology. Marx calls the, the process, when you mislead people away from the facts with these kinds of stories, he calls it mystification. Okay. So we've got the base, the structure, the superstructure. Now the conflict in conflict theory is about conflict between social classes. Remember, it's a macro theory. We're talking about large groups of people in this, specifically in this, social classes. The conflict is not people fighting. It's not what the word means normally. The conflict is a difference in class interests. And when you think about it, it's very easy to see. As a class, if you own a factory, Let's say, to take an example from Marx's time, you want to pay workers the lowest possible amount. You want to pay the lowest possible amount for worker safety. You want to pay the least possible amount for uh, worker benefits. Uh, back when Marx was writing, there was no such thing as a weekend, and there was a normal 12-hour workday, and no such thing as overtime. Um, because all of these things cut into profit. And so the bourgeois or the capitalist class did not want those things. Well, this is in basic conflict to the workers' class interest. The proletariat or the workers want the exact opposite. They want a safe workplace. They want benefits, reasonable hours, um, and reasonable pay. So that's the conflict is the conflict between the interests of the two social classes go like that, two economic classes. That's the conflict. It's between social classes, not between individual people. That's not what this is about. Remember, we're on the macro level. Conflict theory is a good tool for explaining inequality, looking at how it works, because if you understand how it works, maybe you can figure out a way to make things a little more equal, a little more fair. Um, now, when we discussed functionalism, we talked about the war on drugs as an example. I'm going to carry that same example over to show you what happens if I were to, if you were to apply conflict theory to the war on drugs in an analysis. And maybe you want to apply conflict theory to your um, final paper project where you analyze a video from the playlist. Um, you'll see different theories seem to explain different things, fit different cases. Okay. So the, here's the first question. Marx, Marx is a follow the dollar guy. Um, he wants to know who profits who benefits and who loses. So in, in doing a conflict theory analysis, you have to trace who benefits and who loses. So look for ways that economic class shapes the process. Okay, and then what are the large economic effects? Okay, so war on drugs, example. We've got two guys, uh, Bob and Joe. Bob lives in a congested city. Um, he works uh, full time um, in in a, a blue collar occupation. Um, lives in a lower middle class neighborhood, or maybe even uh, talking about class in America is so weird. Um, it wouldn't be considered a middle class neighborhood. So something below that. Um, maybe where the, wherever there's cheaper housing. Some people call it the low rent district, that kind of thing. So that's Bob's economic reality. Then we've got Joe. Uh, Joe is an architect who lives in a gated community in a big old house with a backyard with a hot tub in the back. Okay. Two 
here, here's a fact, background fact. We have differential patrolling according to social class. Lower economic areas are patrolled more often and more visibly than upper class areas and in the case of the gated community often the city police can't even get into the gate because they have private security guards um, and they don't want the police in there so it's a way of insulating themselves from the police because the patrols are essentially to look for people breaking into houses and things that are private pri the private patrols Okay, so we have differential patrolling, which means already, based on economic class, Bob, if he's doing something wrong, has a higher chance of getting busted. Yep, sad but true. And if you later we'll talk about uh, deviance and a little bit about criminal justice, and you'll see the numbers on that. Okay, so what are, let's say, Bob is doing some illegal drug in his neighborhood, um, his, it's hot, the window's open, um, police car goes by, they see him, uh, what's going to happen? Bob's getting busted. Now let's look at Joe. Joe is sitting in the hot tub in his backyard that has walls, inside a walled community, doing some illegal drugs. What's happening to Joe? Chances are Joe is not going to get arrested. Not unless somebody, you know, turns him in. He's, he's not going to get arrested because he's not being patrolled in his private backyard. His economic class gives him that protection from, the, from law enforcement by giving him a private property space of his own secluded inside of a, a gated environment that is also secluded from the police. So social class gives him that advantage. So who benefits from social, the way social class is structured? Already we can see it's benefiting Joe. It's not having uh, so good of a time on poor Bob, who just got arrested. Now let's say there's a nosy neighbor, and they look over the fence and see Joe in the hot tub and say, oh, he's doing illegal drugs, and they call the cops. And... For some reason, this is highly unlikely, but let's just go with it for an example's sake. Let's say Joe also gets arrested. Let's follow Bob and Joe through the process. Okay, so what you ask for are what are the economic effects? What are the effects? What happens after the arrest? Okay, three things happen. You make bail or you don't. You can afford a good lawyer to get you off or reduce sentence, or you can't. And you have, if you're fined, you have the ability to pay the fine, or you don't. If you don't have the ability, you have to serve jail time instead of paying the fine. Already you can see how the economic standing of Bob and Joe is going to let Joe fly through this. Joe can get a high-priced attorney get the case dismissed, um, maybe convince the judge he needs to go to rehab. Um, Joe is going to come out of this um, a lot easier than um, Bob is. Now, if Bob doesn't have the money to make bail, he sits in jail. If he doesn't have the money, which he won't, given his job, for a private attorney, he'll get an overworked public defender who, bless their hearts, work very hard, but maybe look at somebody's case for 10 minutes before representing them. They don't really have the time. They're overloaded with cases. And so chances are Bob's getting a harsher penalty. And he is representative of people in his social class. People in, this, in the proletariat don't have the resources to escape this fate. Now let's follow it through, okay? Who, how else does this play out? Well, for Joe, I mean, I'm sorry, for Bob, our guy that, that got arrested and had to go to jail because he didn't have the money to get out, when he gets out, then what happens? When he gets out, he can't pass a 
background check. So he can't get a job or maybe keep a job. He can't get a, um, in some places they won't rent to you if you have anything, any kind of criminal record. He can't get a student loan if he wants to go back to school because that's prohibited by federal law. You can't have a drug conviction and get a student loan. So basically you've taken somebody who was teetering towards the bottom of the class structure and push them even farther down. And so the outcomes for the bourgeois and for the proletariat are very different under the same system. That's how conflict theory helps you see what's actually going on. Now the flip side of this is to ask who profits? Where's the money going? Who profits from this system, from the way that, which class profits from the way that this is going down here? Well, think about the cause and effect. The effect of the war on drugs and of a lot of people getting arrested for drugs is that police departments and law enforcement agencies need more money so they get bigger budgets. And that takes away from other services. Bigger profits for prison guards, because it's a job creator. We have more people in prison than any other nation on earth, mostly for drug crimes, nonviolent drug crimes, and uh, that's a lot of prisons and a lot of guards. That is a lot. Um, this gives, and the privatization, the move to make prisons private, in, private for-profit companies, gives a profit incentive for producing prisoners, for having a system that arrests more people, because it's a profit. Attorneys, paralegal, bail bond, that industry benefits, they're making more money than ever, than before the war on drugs. Um, the bourgeois, they avoid penalties, and they avoid or get less harsh penalties, and they have enough, enough financial resources that they're not really very likely to lose their job over this. In fact, it will probably never be found out by their employer. Workers in occupations that are lower on the social ladder are also more surveilled. They're more... Um, they're more policed in the workplace, things like drug testing. Um, you know, when he's got, how do you explain, how does Bob explain why he's away from work when he's sitting in jail? Um, they're, they can't afford to sue for wrongful dismissal. So if he gets fired for being in jail, that's it. He gets fired. He's essentially forced into illegal activity because there's no place in the legitimate economy for him anymore because this has pushed him out. So that's who loses. So who benefits? The owners of private prisons, the capitalist class benefits, um, the organizations that um, execute the system that, that do these things uh, benefit more jobs through job creation. So the legal process is part of the structure that includes the economy and the institution of law I'm sorry the legal pro yeah the legal process is part of the structure so remember base structure superstructure so the arrest the court the prison system all of that is part of the structure in this in the institution of law enforcement now what about the superstructure that last part well, we've got a media campaign, both overt and just kind of woven into fictional stories that we see in the media, um, that drug users are complete losers and criminals and just not worthy of any thought whatsoever. Well, this ideology lets people feel like the system that we have is fair and just. But we just saw the difference in outcomes between Bob and Joe that the system is not fair and just. It treats you differently according to which economic class you belong to. And when this happens, Marx calls that misleading mystification. 
He says that this is process is called mystification, where the ideology sounds good, it sounds reasonable, it sounds like, oh yeah, you know that, yeah, we have a fair system and those bad people went away. But when you think about it, not all the bad people went away, only the ones that didn't have money. That's what conflict theory is saying. And so the social class that loses is the proletariat. Okay, so to sum it all up, um, conflict theory is a macro theory that's great to use in examining inequality. Um, and it, it's a follow the dollar theory. Um, who benefits, who loses, and how are the different social classes treated under the system? Okay, see you next time.